Well, thank you everyone for coming together again to re-record this session that we originally did on March the 3rd of um, just last month. And unfortunately, we had technical difficulties for this session that was called Non-Indigenous Faculty Supporting Indigenous Graduate Students. And um, I would like to just acknowledge uh, the places where we are before we begin doing the actual work. Uh, so I would like to just introduce myself as Shaquapmik Scale from the Interior Plateau regions of uh, what is now known as British Columbia. My Shaquapmik name is Hukla and my I always say my colonial name is Dorothy Christian, and I'm not. And <laughs> so I have the privilege to live, work, and play on the lands of my Coast Salish cousins. And uh, in particular, the uh, Squamish, the Musqueam, the Sabretooth, and the other nations that our campuses at SFU sit on, the Coquitlam, the Katsi, and uh, Snohomish, I believe, and um, Sawasan. There are a number of nations that SFU is related to. So I would like to just acknowledge um, the spirits of these lands and the peoples of these lands. And, and ask for their presence and guidance in the work that we're doing today. And I again just want to really give thanks to all of you for taking the time to do this uh, because uh, we're at a really critical and important time in our history in Canada, all around so-called reconciliation and I really am excited about being able to talk to you all about working together with Indigenous peoples in a higher education institution. And um, today I want to just talk a little bit about my own experience as an MA student when I came here to SFU. I came into the School of Communications and um, I was coming from working as a professional in the film and television industry. And that may have affected um, people's kinds of hands off with me when I first came into the school, people assuming that I would know how to navigate in the institution. However, you know, that was not my reality. You know, I mean, the institution itself is a really complex place to navigate. You know, and, and when you're coming in as a grad student, there's all kinds of things that you need to know. And uh, nobody helped me in that. I ended up having to change my supervisors after the first year. And uh, my second supervisor was Dr. Kirsten McAllister, who has thankfully uh, agreed to be here today to talk about how we developed our relationship in while she was my supervisor on my, my committee. So when I, I came to SFU in 2006, so at that time there was visibly no support for Indigenous grad students. I used to have to go to the Indigenous Student Centre, which I think itself was trying to find its place on campus. And at that time it was in the Maggie Benson uh, Centre. And I would go there just to be with other brown faces. You know, and they were all undergrad students. I never met another grad student on campus, you know, so I didn't really have anyone to talk to about my experience. So um, I was very grateful to Dr. McAllister because she really helped me understand. 
and she totally oriented me to the expectations of the program. So then I was able to, you know, revamp my time um, commitments. And I remember one of the first things she said was, you have to start saying no <laughs> to community because I was like called on by the community a lot. And I was out doing a lot of community work. And so I really had to learn how to do that, how to pull back from community uh, service and totally focus on my academic work. So she helped me to see that I needed to treat my program like it was my job. And, and that's literally what I did. But I had all kinds of learning that I needed to do. So once we got, um, she helped to get me on track in terms of organizing my time and knowing what deadlines I had to go through and what I had to prepare for. So then I got my draft one, my first draft written of my MA thesis. And I remember I had a meeting with my committee and I was really upset because I came to that meeting and I said, to them, I, I am going to quit my program because I had to ask myself, once I finished writing this thesis, would I be able to stand up in global indigenous country with this written piece of work and be proud of it? And the answer was no because I sounded like an absolutely uptight scholar in, in that thesis that I had written. And luckily, uh, my committee members knew about my work uh, in film and television, and they said, Dorothy, you're a storyteller, and there are all kinds of stories underneath what you're talking about here in this first draft. So after that meeting, it's like I felt like I had permission to tell stories. And I went home and I totally indigenized my thesis. And at that time, I had just um, read Joanne Archibald's book, uh, Indigenous Story Work, Educating Heart, Body, Mind and Spirit. And I felt like I had permission to write from and speak from an Indigenous holistic perspective. So I rewrote my thesis in four voices and I challenged all the conventions, of course, of the institution in terms of I uh, wrote in different fonts for all of my different voices because spirit was rep uh, dreams represented my spirit voice. And then I had a storyteller voice from my stories and experiences in the field. And then of course I had the, the um, mind voice, which was the scholar. And I wrote that in the conventional, I can't remember what I was writing in Chicago or or APA format. And my fourth voice was what I called the silent voice of my heart, because I felt that that voice, because it's the emotion, was the one that brought all the voices together. So, it, but it was silent. And um, so in my second draft, I was really, really happy with it. And uh, because I was able to get across what I wanted to say uh, from a theoretical point of view, as well as from an experiential point of view. And uh, I was just uh, really elated with the second draft. And so I was able to, um, my committee were totally on board. And uh, when I went to defend it, uh, I found out uh, that I passed with minor revisions. And it was so beautiful because at the defense, I, it was also indigenized. 
because uh, a group of women from the community came and as soon as we found out that I was uh, that I had passed with minor revisions uh, they started singing the women's warrior song which was just I mean it just made me feel so good and it, I was I actually cried I remember and my family some of my family had come down and um, my sisters ha helped me because I did a giveaway at the defense once the, once the thesis was defended and we went through that process I gave gifts to my committee to the external uh, examiner and also to an elder who I had given tobacco to to come and attend the defense and uh, from the Squamish nation my thinking was that um, if anyone from my nation questioned what I was doing down here with this master's work that I did that they could come and talk to Sam George you know and uh, he could recount to them what he had witnessed and um, and then after that my brother and I hosted a meal uh, for a number of people who had more supported me in that process um, at uh, Nuba downtown so that was my my way of feasting people because I couldn't of course have cooks and and uh, do all of that like I would do in my community and um, and I also did that for my my PhD but that was my MA experience and um, grateful to Dr. McAllister for having guided me through that process and to be very open and generous with allowing me to bring indigenous ways of doing into the institution you know so I think that uh, a lot of indigenous grad students are not aware that they can do that you know so I will now uh, turn the mic over to Dr. McAllister to share her experience yes yeah, so um thank you uh Dr. Christian um for um sharing the work you've done and um the actual transformations that you've um, imparted in our school and at our university. For me, when I was working with you, I was an assistant professor. I had just been hired in two, 2003. And because of my background, it was, I very much looked to you as an expert, someone with extraordinary knowledge and and status and authority so it was quite um it was it was a challenge for me to figure out how to take that title supervisor and, and i actually could never ever refer to you as student um never right um so i, I that's a word that i could not use because i felt i was learning from you um, I also knew, given my experience as a racialized uh, woman at Simon Fraser University, where I was doing research on my own community's racial elimination, which happened in BC um, and in Canada, and was very raw still and still is um, in this city, in this space. Um, I think. I was dealing with a lot of the universities, not just lack of knowledge, lack of protocol, but the racial anxieties and hostilities against my presence there. And so when Dr. Christian started the program, on the one hand, um, I felt if there's something I can do to facilitate this extraordinary um, leader, um, do the work she wants to do here, I will do it. I'll do whatever, whatever is needed that she um, sees as necessary. Um, but it was a, a learning process for me to sort out how to position myself. Um, on the other hand, I was completely excited by Dr. Christian's project. Um, in communication studies, uh, while 
in the past, there's been work um, that's been really informed by cultural studies and different types of um, knowledge production. It's, it's very, as I'll discuss a little later, it's very white and nationalist, even though it sees itself as progressive. So Dr. Christian's project was exciting because I too was trying to find ways to, um, to find, to, to sh share voice, share protocols in my own production of knowledge. And with someone who's an, who is an expert um, in storytelling, film production, like massive CV that you have Dr. Christian <laughs> in this area, it was, it was this, this wonderful opportunity for me to also learn and work with Dr. Christian. Um, in terms of, and I'll just say uh, at this point, I'll make it brief, but in terms of uh, the defense, this was something that after working with Dr. Christian, I realized there was no way we could do a conventional defense, like, uh, you know, where Dr. Christian is being examined by a panel of, um, you know, university professors. Um, there would be a discussion and examination or whatever, but Dr. Christian, I, I relied on Dr. Christian to inform me about what would be appropriate. And she actually um, developed the format and the protocols of that defense. And it's precedent setting. It's groundbreaking what you did, Dr. Christian. And I remember trying to prepare for the defense two months in advance, trying to, I got the um, phonetics of your nation, so Shikwetnik. And I practiced every day in my calendar, I had the phonetics and I practiced for about 10 minutes trying to repeat and try to make sure I didn't embarrass Dr. Christian at the defense when I had to speak. So I, it was again, a wonderful opportunity for, for me to learn. Um, and the, I remember um, Elder Sam George coming into the room. I think he was wearing a motorcycle jacket and he had like, like, he was so cool, right? Like all of these amazing um, elders and members of different nations you brought in. It was like this powerhouse moment of brilliance and uh, fun and uh, yeah, intellectually and politically, just a really amazing experience. So that, that was a president setting experience and moment in the university, in our department. And um, it made it possible for the department to imagine, and for me to imagine as a member of the department, how important it is to indigenize on the defense. So I think we've talked before about how it's important when you're working with um, indigenous um, uh, people from different indigenous nations who come to the university, who are pursuing the graduate degrees, how what they do in terms of transformation you, you work to make sure that knowledge is passed down. And, and so that was very important for me to do, but yes. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, yes. That's great. Yes, my elder um, had a Harley. <laughs> and I remember thinking that was so cool because I remember we came out of the building and he was getting on his Harley and <laughs> that was just uh, amazing that he brought his um, pony to the to the defense. So, um, who would like to speak next? Sophie, are you ready? Uh, sure, I'm absolutely ready. I'm I'm very happy to be here. That it was just a really wonderful to hear the two of you together. Um, on this this incredible ground um, landmark event of your defense and and the storytelling and and the four voices that went into the writing, and it really resonates with uh, the work that um, I've seen with uh, the indigenous students, graduate students that I've had the the opportunity to work with. So hi everyone, my name is Sophie McCall, and I'm a, a non indigenous settler scholar. I'm Scottish descended and I teach Indigenous literatures in the English department and and I really do feel like I'm forever learning and unlearning how to read, listen to, and engage with Indigenous stories. 
So I've, I've had this incredible experience of working as a committee member or as a supervisor with three Indigenous PhD students over the past four years. So uh, they are Natalie Knight, who is a Yurok Dene poet, scholar, and activist. And she defended her dissertation in 2018. Jordan Abel, a Nis Niska poet, visual artist, and scholar who defended in 2019. And Mackenzie Ground, a Cree poet, scholar, artist, and land-based knowledge maker and seeker who is currently writing her dissertation. Um, so to me, what, uh, there are two questions that I'd like to try to address today, which is what have, what have I learned in working with these students? And what steps have I tried to take to support and hold up the work of these students? So I've, in working with these students, I have learned of the, the daunting hurdles that these students have had to overcome in order to carve out decolonial spaces within their fields and their lives. I've also learned of their incredible ingenuity, persistence, and bravery in scaling and overcoming these hurdles. If I had to use one word that kind of encapsulates or, or offers a, a way to understand the, the incredible contributions these, these uh, students have made, is that they each use Indigenous methodologies as a way through the thickets of settler colonial framings and silences that, that are a part of the university experiences uh, still to this day. In fact, in my experience, this label indigenous methodologies has been useful as a type of crowbar, institutionally speaking, that enable the students to do the kind of project they want to do in the way that they want to do it. While there are numerous books and studies with that very title, Indigenous Methodologies, there is no meth manual or checklist to follow. Jordan, Natalie, and Mackenzie each mobilized Indigenous methodologies in utterly unique ways, reflecting their research interests and personal experiences. Each has embraced these, those practices that enable them to reclaim space and proclaim presence in settler colonial spaces. Reflecting back upon their projects, both the content of their research and the process of writing, I can draw out four points of commonality in their approaches. Uh, these are number one, grappling with positionality, two, foregrounding creativity, three, resisting conventional forms and genres of scholarly research, and four, reclaiming Indigenous presence within the spaces of the settler colonial university. So what I mean when I say the students grapple with their own positionality is that they're writing and researching in a situated and grounded way from their own unique, dynamic, and ever-changing perspectives. This is not always encouraged in scholarly work, though things are slowly changing. The idea of objective knowledge remains a hurdle that Indigenous graduate students have to contend with. Number two, foregrounding creativity is probably one of the most remarkable features of each of these PhD projects that I've been lucky enough to be involved with. And, and that is uh, really strongly illustrated by, Doris, uh, by Dr. Christian's description of her MA thesis as well. What each of these students have done is to continually weave together their scholarly work with creative work, including autobiographical fiction, visual art, documentary collage, and land-based practices. Um, for example, Natalie Knight's dissertation was a series of scholarly chapters that was woven through with autobiographical interludes. And these interludes were powerful manifestations of, of the work of self-reflection that she was involved with. Um, resisting conventional forms and genres of scholarly research is a key element of Indigenous methodologies, which necessarily disrupt and transform mainstream understandings of Indigenous research. In Jordan Abel's words, his aim is to transform what he calls the empty spaces of settler uh, forms of knowledge into spaces of dialogue, 
by what he calls reorganizing, reframing, and repositioning research questions. And finally, reclamation takes many shapes and forms in their work. As Jordan Abel puts it, his project is not about reinscribing Indigenous absence, as it is about rearticulating Indigenous presence. And yet many of the research questions that he has encountered in Indigenous studies emphasize the importance of recovering ancestral relationships to land, territory, family, and community in ways that are deeply fraught for Abel, given how he has been dispossessed by those very relationships. So as a supervisor or committee member, I see my role here as demystifying in institutional processes so that students can, as I said before, do the projects they want to do in the way they want to do them. In other words, in a self-determining way. And Kristen's example was, or Kirsten's example was, was a beautiful one um, in, in underlining that for, for Dr. McAllister, Dr. Christian was not a student uh, and was, was a, a, an incredible learning experience for her too. I also see my role as exposing the academic disciplinary, disciplinary walls between fields and areas of research that need to be dismantled and identifying the hidden doors that need to be opened. And above all, I see my job as one of giving back or reciprocity. And here, I, I've always been very inspired by Dorothy Christian's work because uh, uh, Dr. Christian has written on this concept of reciprocity and the concept of giving back. Um, and uh, in one article, she writes that we can't just keep taking and taking and taking and not give something back. And she goes on to say that once we're able to, quote, relate to each other as dignified, autonomous human beings, we can develop a shared active engagement in the decolonizing process. So I try, but don't always succeed to put giving back or, uh, into the center of all that I do as a teacher and learner in Indigenous studies and as a committee member dedicated to supporting Indigenous students who are pursuing their projects. That's great. Thank you so much, Dr. McCall. And I would like to ask uh, David and Travis, when you speak to please introduce yourself and your discipline. I realize that I didn't do that at the very beginning. And um, Dr. McAllister, if you could do that a little bit later, I know we talked about um, School of Communication, but we didn't talk about your uh, research focus and, and all of those kinds of things. So, uh, David or Travis, who wants to go? David? Okay. Um, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Christian, for gathering us here and, um, and really um, setting uh, both uh, a tone and um, and providing you know insights that I'm I'm deeply grateful for, and I, I think that whatever I will say now is really just a, uh, an afterthought at best <laughs> to what's already been articulated uh, by you and uh, and and the and the follow ups by um, Dr. McAllister and Dr. McCall. Um, uh, my name is uh, David Cheriandi, and um, when I'm not up at SFU, I live uh, near a Sanok, uh, a place that the, lair, uh, the late writer uh, Lee Maracol uh, taught me was once a site where members of different Indigenous nations gather to share uh, the bounty of the land and waters. Um, I am a Black person of mixed African and South Asian heritage. I teach in the Department of English at SFU, and I specialize in contemporary Black, Caribbean, and Canadian literatures. I, um, I happened uh, to write the first, um, uh, I guess, doctoral dissertation on Black Canadian literature. And um, I, I suppose I've learned a thing or two about that, that experience. Um, 
of uh, attempting to do something different in the in the academy. Um, and uh, I'm also a writer and uh, someone who teaches creative writing. And um, I'm sh I've just listened, of course, to ways in which uh, Dr. McCall's talked about the enormous uh, creativity of the uh, three uh, PhD candidates that, in fact, I, we've both uh, sat on the supervisory committees of uh, Jordan Abel, Natalie Light, Knight and Mackenzie Ground. And I have been so deeply struck by the creativity um, and insights of these uh, students. Um, I too um, have, uh, have um, been um, amazed by the insights uh, that these students uh, have uh, offered me. Um, I, I see, um, if, if anything, I, I'm the one who's, who's uh, derived a great deal of knowledge uh, from the experience of working with them. And so I, I would say in general, my, my experience is to approach the experience of uh, teaching Indigenous students with great uh, humility and, and gratitude. Um, but I, um, or to and, um, I suspect that a lot of uh, what um, together uh, these students and, and I have um, been able to, uh, to, to do together has uh, come from some of my embodied experiences um, as, a, as, a, as a Black uh, person and researcher in the university. Um, a type of uh, relation uh, that Black and Indigenous peoples have uh, exhibited for, for generations, for centuries, um, in which uh, I have again very humbly and with great gratitude been able to partake in at SFU. I've learned three things, I think, from working with uh, the students that I mentioned, uh, Jordan Abel, Natalie Light, and Mackenzie Ground. And uh, I would try to sum up these things under the words uh, care, uh, knowledge, and method, um, or, but, but maybe method slash form. And I'll maybe just talk really briefly about um, how uh, these questions or issues have been illuminated uh, for me uh, by uh, having this great, um, this great privilege of teaching the students that I've just mentioned. The first uh, term care um, is, um, is for me maybe one of the most in, important ones. Um, I think those of us who have come from contexts where um, our very presence in, in the academy, in institutions uh, like a university, um, cannot be taken for granted and where you, one arrives as uh, a stranger, uh, sometimes the only one, uh, not in classrooms, but in whole disciplines. This can be a very difficult experience. Um, it can be a very alienating experience. And, um, and it can be an experience that's, um, uh, that's, um, that plays itself out in, in all kinds of different contexts in the, in the academy, in the classroom itself, in which one faces a, a burden of representation, in which uh, the forms of knowledge that you hold dear to your heart um, is, is not addressed. And, and somewhat the opposite, as I, I've just mentioned, is those moments when uh, you are turned upon, turned to, to provide knowledge when you may be, uh, like everyone else around you, on a journey. To, to discover knowledge. You may very well have uh, forms of knowledge that are ignored, but that you, you, you are also uh, attempting to discover something, something else. And navigating those, uh, those conditions uh, can be really difficult. I think we oftentimes underestimate the degree that even just having someone in the academy, in the classroom, that shares your experience and that you can have a friendly word or two um, is so conducive to learning. Um, it, it really does make a difference. Uh, and all the more having a space that you can go to, having groups of people that you can feel um, help um, 
alleviate the sometimes um, sometimes very hard feeling of unbelonging um, in uh, academic spaces. So I think um, I think um, care is is the answer, and I think it comes with the recognition that um, not everyone is experiencing the same uh, academy. Um, people are. Um, are, are experiencing it in very, very different ways. And um, I, think, um, I think being attentive to that is the very first thing, um, forms of conviviality and friendliness um, and also concern um, uh, go a long way. Um, and I think it, it also uh, speaks to the need for the academy to, um, to receive uh, the um, students, um, indigenous students, black students to hire more black students, indigenous, uh, black faculty, uh, indigenous faculty, because uh, again, these things uh, make a difference. The embodied knowledge, the, the, um, the, the ways of caring for others, um, it, not exclusively because, uh, you know, um, I think we can we can be caring uh, across, and we must be caring across cultures and races. But um, uh, it's just an issue that I've, um, I guess I've, um, I've thought thought a little bit about. I guess the other term that I wanted to just reflect upon is is knowledge, and um, I remember being once in the in the uh, Caribbean, and here again I'm I'm attempting to suggest how uh, my my experiences and interests as a, as a Black uh, researcher connects with the Indigenous students that I've taught. Um, I was in uh, Jamaica and a researcher named uh, Erna Broadbur, who's a, a writer and community organizer, was speaking about these, uh, these community-based research projects that she was working on in, in rural Jamaica, in fact. And she was speaking about the various forms of uh, the various archives and documents and texts uh, that she um, she was drawing upon in libraries and other places. But then, and speaking of the archives that she would visit, and then she made this gesture, the archive, and then she repeated herself and she said, the archive. And that gesture to touch her head, uh, the most beautiful and I think lucid gesture um, about the cultural memory of a disenfranchised, disenfranchised people spoke to me uh, very deeply about uh, the different forms of knowledge uh, that um, Black and, and in my experience, uh, humble experience, Indigenous students are working uh, with in the academy. That is, um, the academy does offer um, and and uh, th this is my this is my feeling. This is why I believe more Black and Indigenous students should be in the academy. The academy offers resources and methods and and texts that have been overlooked. Um, I'm just speaking of my own disciplinary concerns. Uh, there's so much Indigenous writing that's been brought to light by colleagues such as Deanna Rader, and uh, even the students that I mentioned bring to light the texts that are there that are that are ignored. But there is also the question of, again, embodied, deep cultural knowledge uh, that uh, students uh, bring. Um, that again has been for me a source of inspiration and, um, and, uh, and just an opportunity to learn. Uh, finally, I just wanna talk about um, method and uh, form. And I, I, I feel that um, Dr. McCall uh, really um, explain this um, in such a compelling way. So I don't have too much more to add, but um, this, this has, uh, with care and knowledge, been uh, such, a, um, uh, such a pivotal and again, inspiring term to reflect upon. Um, and Indigenous students have taught me so much about what is crucial about Indigenous methodology, and about creative form. Um, that, um, and I wonder sometimes if this is an easier thing for, for, um, for my discipline or me as a creative writer to kind of think through, because, I guess because uh, there's so much um, invested in 
I take that back actually with English studies. It's not an easier thing in English studies <laughs> to think through. I think um, nevertheless, um, I think there, uh, this has been the real joy of uh, in working with the, um, the indigenous students that I've uh, worked with. Uh, Jordan Abel, Mackenzie Brown, Madeline Knight have been uh, not only employing as um, Sophie McCullough suggested, um, different and uh, profoundly compelling um, indigenous methods in doing the work they're doing. They also um, have insisted upon uh, unique forms of creativity in doing work within the academy. And um, I've just found that, um, again, um, a, a source of, of, of a tremendous inspiration. Anyway, I think I'm going to stop there. And uh, so, again, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really honored to be here. And I'd love to just listen from now on. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, David. Travis. Hello, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Christian, for organizing the session and for inviting me to be a part of the conversation. Uh, my name is Travis Sawe. Uh, I'm descended from settlers um, who, uh, mostly German and English, who, who, who settled on the lands of the Shawnee and Maumee people um, south of the, of the Great Lakes. And I've been fortunate enough to be here uh, on Coast Salish territories of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations um, for, for just over 12 years. I am uh, an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University, where I teach uh, classes uh, regarding public health epidemiology. And uh, I'm just in my third year of my um, appointment at the Faculty of Health Sciences, and um, have just this year taken uh, my first uh, PhD student, uh, Harlan Pruden. And, um, and uh, so a lot of my reflections come from um, my experience working with, with Harlan over the last few years. And as, um, as a doctoral supervisor, uh, like, like uh, many of uh, my colleagues who spoke before me, I feel somewhat uneasy about that terminology. It's not quite a, the right fit, but um, here we are. So um, I'll just say kind of um, what I think um, brings me to this position. Um, and then most of my reflections are really just trying to be very honest, transparent, um, um, but 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 uh, thoughtful and, and, and account and accountable about the struggles that I've experienced so far as a non-indigenous um, uh, faculty member um, supporting uh, one and hopefully many more uh, indigenous graduate students. And then I'll, I'll speak a little bit about some future commitments that I'm inspired to make um, based on on the. The comments and, and, and knowledge that Dr. Christian and uh, Dr. McAllister, Dr. McCall, Dr. Charyandi have shared. So um, I, my training is in social work and then in social epidemiology, which um, I think makes me in some ways well suited to being open to uh, Indigenous ways of working and, and researching. Um, I, I, I care deeply about research and, and um, activism and, and practice that tries to understand how our social context influences where we're at and in particular our health. And I am generally as a person and as someone trained in social work, uh, very relationship driven, um, but I wanna be really careful in, um, in saying that this kind of predisposition um, to, uh, to working with indigenous scholars does not absolve me of my responsibility to decolonize my work, uh, to make, very explicit my internal biases about what counts as knowledge and what counts as knowledge in, in, in the academy. Um, and that's something I have to remind myself of every day. Um, I, like Dr. McAllister said, that the term student doesn't quite fit for me either uh, in the case of Harlan. And, and, and I should say, maybe some of the, the folks watching this um, video will be inspired to have a look at um, a conversation that Dr. Christian had recently with Harlan. It's really a marvelous um, uh, video that, that, that's available through the SFU uh, website that I would encourage folks to uh, to, to, to take a look at. Uh, and, and Harlan has really taught me 
over and over again about the importance of relational accountability. This is a term that shows up in, in uh, Sean Wilson's work, uh, who he's a, a Cree scholar. Um, and, uh, and simply put, it, it, it means constantly asking myself again and again at every stage of research mentorship, um, uh, am I fulfilling my responsibilities to my relationships? And in the case of working with an Indigenous graduate student, you know, my, my big learning is that um, you, he in turn, especially because his research is with Indigenous communities, means that he has accountabilities beyond the academy and I have to make space for them and learn from them. And by extension, I'm now accountable to them. And um, that's a very different way of working from how I went about my PhD. Um, and so I'm grateful for that, but I, 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 I take that on really humbly. I would say um, some of my struggles so far, um, uh, you know, as I said, I'm early, early in, in this process. So really appreciate hearing from, um, from uh, the, the other colleagues here today who've, who've had a, a number of other indigenous students. Um, I, I feel one thing that I think a lot about is how having lived experience uh, can be a double-edged sword, lived experience in the area where you're doing research. Um, I think there, there, there's obviously a strength to this uh, because um, someone with lived experience has really deep knowledge and um, the, the, the real lived expertise to, um, to interpret and, and, and analyze the, the topics that they're working in, but also it comes with an emotional and a relational labor that's really quite demanding. And although I'm not indigenous, I'm familiar with this because uh, as, a, as a queer man, I've a lot of my research has been about queer and trans and two-spirit people and communities. And I know that it can be hard to strike that balance in, and um, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, what, what you were saying earlier, Dr. Christian, about you know, learning the, the need to say no and figure out those boundaries. And that's something that I find uh, myself struggling with, and when students come to me, Indigenous students in the case of, of Harlan, but even non-Indigenous students who are working in an area where they have lived experience, that's a real uh, struggle to find that balance and make sure, um, for me as a, as a supervisor, that I support uh, the students in finding time to step away um, or share the burden of knowing and learning, and, and, and um, sometimes that's something that I'm able to do as someone who doesn't have lived experience in that area. Um, when, when Dr. Christian asked me to be a part of this, I was reminded over and over again that I do experience a lot of fear and doubt about my ability to um, really do justice um, to a student who's Indigenous and, and working in Indigenous research. And I think what I try to do there is um, acknowledge it, talk to some of my other non-Indigenous colleagues about it, but not let it um, stop me from moving forward. And I think I'm reminded of this concept um, that Robin D'Angelo has talked about of white fragility, and I think this is a variation on it, that if I feel, if I have so much uh, insecurity and anxiety about being in this role as a non-Indigenous person, and I'm, and I'm repeatedly bringing this up with my students, um, then I'm asking them to do work that is not their work to do. Um, I'm, I'm creating additional conflict for them, and so I try to acknowledge that fear um, and that resistance, um, but but to move move through it and and to process it with um, some of my colleagues um, who I think are are really open to the concept um, as non-indigenous um, faculty, but who who understand the work that needs to be done. Um, I'll just mention uh, two more struggles um, related to to methods and and. Um, kind of unconscious assumptions and bias. So uh, thank you, Dr. Charyandi, for, for raising this theme of, of methods and how do we make sense of methods uh, for those of us like myself who are trained in kind of Western ways of doing research. Um, how do we make space and figure out um, where indigenous methods uh, fit? Um, and that is definitely a, a constant struggle for me. I'm fortunate to have um, a, Harlan as a student who um, really embraces uh, this uh, Mi'kmaq elder concept of two-eyed seeing where um, we try to think through which Western 
uh, methodologies would be compatible with indigenous methodologies. So they're not, um, it's not that we can just um, pick and choose and any will fit together. Some uh, Western methodologies I think are um, uh, really not appropriate. And, and um, uh, Denise Wilson, who is a Maori scholar uh, has written about this, that there has to be a really intentional and careful pairing of these methodologies if it's going to happen. Um, and that's a challenge. And, you know, as someone who's trained in um, epidemiology uh, and social epidemiology, where the, the convention is take two groups, let's say indigenous and non-indigenous, quantify health issues and compare them, um, I learn, um, continue to learn and, and unlearn uh, through, through Harlan's uh, guidance, that this uh, really just reifies some serious structural uh, injustices and problems and doesn't move the conversation forward. And so that kind of practice that is so typical in uh, Western epidemiology is just not going to work in this case. And so that's a, a, a struggle, but a, certainly a struggle uh, worth uh, having. And, and then the last uh, challenge that I'll talk about is really making um, my unconscious assumptions um, and priorities explicit to um, students, to their committees, to the people around me. Um, this maybe uh, is parallels a little bit what you were saying, Dr. McCall, about pointing to the hidden walls within our institutions. I think um, for me, uh, I, I have a tendency to want to get things right um, and not air the the kind of topics or ideas where I'm still uh, struggling or, or, or even just unaware, or uninformed. Um, and that can also hold back um, students' progress because they need to know and they need to hear what are my starting assumptions and what are my biases. And unless I make those really clear and explicit, we can't, um, we can't really account for them in the work and we can't really identify them when they show up. But I'm really inspired by this conversation today. I think some of the commitments that I would humbly like to make um, going forward are um, one kind of just thinking about what I said earlier about the different levels and layers of relationships uh, around supporting indigenous scholars. Uh, I would like to um, commit more to uh, finding, seeking out cultural mentorship from indigenous elders. Um, I think, you know, when I first came into uh, um, my role as a, an assistant prof, I kind of thought, okay, elders have a place in supporting and being uh, an important resource for Indigenous students and scholars, but what I'm uh, coming to appreciate is that I also need to um, uh, take on uh, a role of, of, of learning and following uh, guidance from Indigenous elders if I'm going to be um, an, an, an active and an effective uh, supervisor. Um, I think for me, writing, I, I, um, I, I really appreciated what you said, Dr. Christian, about how you had to take a few passes through that thesis before you found what felt good, something that you could hold up and, and show to other Indigenous people. Um, and, um, and it's a reminder to me that I need to continue to revisit my assumptions about what uh, constitutes um, good academic writing. And lastly, I think um, really in inspired by this conversation we've had, I want to um, start to work with other uh, non-Indigenous faculty who are supervising Indigenous graduate students, just realizing that there's a lot of um, wisdom and, and support that we can share with one another. So really happy to, to be here and thanks for giving me uh, the opportunity to share my reflections. That is really great. Thank you so much, all of you. Uh, it's I. Um, there were a few, couple of things that capt I, that captured me in your sharing, and in your speaking. And one is when Dr. McAllister talked about how precedent setting it was that we did. Um, the work that we did at the School of Communications and um, it's like where I work with it now I talk to the Indigenous MA and PhD students that I work with in terms of thinking of what they're bringing their Indigenous knowledges that they're bringing to the university that it's a gift to the Academy 
you know, to to contextualize it in that way, you know, because it's uh, precedent setting on so many levels and because we have so many different nations, you know, that are doing different kinds of work and presenting it in many different um, uh, forms and methods and creative ways, right? So um, I will begin to sing that song everywhere I go about Indigenous knowledge as a gift. And I really appreciated uh, Dr. Charyandi's um, comment about being the only black person in the room. Because God knows, I mean, over the last, I don't know how many years, I've talked about the concept of being the only Indian in the room and uh, just how uncomfortable that is. And, uh, you know, when you're, the burden of representation ends up being on your shoulders. But I also would like to bring attention to the dual accountability. I wrote about this in my dissertation, you know, because I feel like even when I was working in the film and, film and television industry, but I felt it really heavily in the academy, was that I was working, walking on the very fine edge of a sword because I was accountable to my own people my own community, my own nation, and Indigenous people generally. But I also had an accountability to the university to some degree. You know, it was, and it was like in the film and television industry, I had a huge accountability to the people I was, whose stories I was carrying out. But I also had an accountability to the broadcaster who I'd signed a contract with, you know, so it was trying to, even back then, I was figuring out how to have Indigenous ways of doing mesh with the demands of deadlines of an industry that's very deadline driven, you know, so um, I don't know whether uh, people who are coming into the academy have that kind of languaging, you know, until they're they're really into their their um, process, you know. But so those are the the things that was brought up as I listened to all of you talk. Um, I yeah, um, I just like to ask um, if we can extend our time together for ten minutes or so because we were. We were so um, technically challenged at the beginning. Um, so, uh, Sophie, you were. Yeah, I, I had a question um, just to follow up on on your your comment uh, and Dr. Cherry Andy's comment about being the only one, the only Indigenous person in the room, um, or the only Black person in the room. And I, I had that experience in my class this this term, where I had only one Indigenous student, and and he did confide that he felt like he, he's never felt a, a more deep loneliness than than being that in that situation for 13 weeks in a class, you know? Mm. So I'm just wondering, you know, if any of you have advice for that scenario, I mean, um, you know, while of course, you know, I wouldn't, you know, point, uh, you know, continually point to this one student um, for, for uh, their perspective in a, in a classroom context, I don't know if there's other ways to to um, relieve that that loneliness for for students um, who find themselves in that situation. If you have any thoughts, I mean, especially in my undergraduate classes, um, there are situations where there's a single Indigenous student, and the there's not just the there's the loneliness, which I think is a really profound, but also it's so uncomfortable and objectionable because what happens is all of the settlers start turning to that one student um, and projecting their anxieties onto them um, about um, indigeneity, about colonialism, as well as expecting them to be the expert about everything. 
And so it's about, which, which I, I didn't talk about this, but it's about trying to, and, and all of you will have done this um, from, from what you said, it'd be really exciting to talk about this, but how do you co-create a space of learning that's, I'll say safer, not safe, because it's never safe. Um, and that if there's only one student, it might be depending on the, that student, between yourself and that student, um, and also creating these invisible walls of protection around them in terms of how the class is conducted so that they don't end up in this as a racialized subject as well. I've experienced this where you're suddenly, like I remember even as an undergraduate holding a book that said racism in the title and suddenly you're the object of all of this racial anxiety. Um, and um, so I think, it, it's very difficult. It's a structural issue. And the question is, how do you co-create that safe space of learning? And it's specific, depends on the course material. But I think maybe this is within our departments where if, if it were possible to create um, networks between students and then also work with, you know, Dorothy in graduate studies um, and create those other spaces, because Dorothy, you talked about the importance of seeing of, of, of the indigenous spaces that the university had, because it is, and then it's, it's equipping students, because the other thing is that, yeah, our university is, is, you know, colonial and racist. The discipline of communication studies sees itself, as I said, as progressive, but it is the bastion of white colonial nationalist knowledge. And um, for, when I started, there was, there had, in our department over the last 40 years, there had been one Indigenous student, or graduate student, who had focused on Indigenous scholarship, one. There were no Indigenous professors across Canada. So I think it's really important to do that realistic inventory of our disciplines in our departments, and then realize how unsafe it is, um, and then start figuring out how to create those safe spaces. Um, and it's not going to be something the university is going to be able to provide on its own because as, as Harlan especially um, has, um, I guess when he's worked with you, uh, Travis, um, he's made really clear and Dorothy, you've done this with me about the relations. So the accountability and building the relations beyond the university because the university tends to isolate and create walls around this, this ivory tower of knowledge production. But, um, Travis, as you said, and Dorothy, when you brought um, elders and your family members to the defense, um, when Michelle Nahani brought Chief Janice George to the defense with Elder Latash and her nation, suddenly you realize the accountability, Travis, as you said, is to the nation. It's way beyond the university. And when Michelle, because of the president setting work that um, Dorothy Christian, Dr. Dorothy Christian did, um, because Chief Janice George came to that defense, we then had to ask the dean, our dean to attend, the dean of graduate study. So it was nation to nation. So when those relationships are there, they're not just like this, um, you know, oh, I like you, I'm going to get to know you. No, you structure them in. But how do you do that in a classroom when there's um, an individual student? Um, it's hard. And, and that's where um, everything, I think everything everyone's talking about, it's like, how do we make those things concrete? How do we get the university administrators to know it's not just like this, you know, invite in an elder, have a little unit, but how do we structure that in? So it is nation to nation. And I'm going to end there because someone's calling me. <laughs> I'm going to hang this up. That was really helpful. Yeah, it, I, I do think that's uh, there's lots there that to think about. And uh, thank you. I was trying to squeeze in a little bit. Um, I realized, Dorothy, you wanted me to introduce myself and I didn't. Yes, but I was, please. Yeah, I was throwing, throwing in stuff. Um, yeah, so I'm Kirsten Emiko McAllister. My um, someone's being very insistent here on phoning. Um, and I, um, my brothers and I grew up on the, the, the territories of the Shnononok people 
on what's known as Vancouver Island. My mother's family, the Nakashimas and Mukai, and on my father's side, the um, Macquarie's and McAllister's go back four generations on these territories. So we've been settlers here for four generations. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of accountability that we have, and there's a lot of relations and history that are very complex um, that, you know, that we have. And I, I'm, I'm in the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. And I want to say that one of the most amazing things that happened was Dr. Carmen Crave from the Stolo Nation, the Chia Nation, accepted a position in our school. And so now she is um, one of the like key leaders in our department. Um, and even though she's assistant professor, she's been asked and required to step forward almost as a full professor in leadership roles. Um, so much of what, um, anything that I have done in the past to try and um, to work with in, in indigenous um, people from different indigenous nations, now it's important I defer to Dr. Carmen Cray and take her leadership in terms of what she determines is right. So we're in a, we're in a situation now where we need more um, indigenous faculty. If they, would, if they would agree to come and work with us, it would be marvelous. But um, that changes the dynamics in the department as well when you, when you have, because I think Dr. Deanna Rudders um, in your department. So you have that leadership in English. So you're really fortunate there as well yeah so anyway that's that's a brief sorry i'm trying to squeeze in a little bit there of um, more information but okay yeah anyone else have some more thoughts on just what you heard from other people's discussions or any reflections on what you yourself said or what others have said David? I was just, um, I'm still reflecting upon what you, how you answered um, uh, Sophie's question, uh, Dr. Dr. Christian, um, by pointing, you know, speaking about what is um, so awkward and difficult about being the only one in the room, but also um, speaking about uh, a different way of understanding one's being and accountability. And uh, I think I'm gonna have to keep reflecting upon that because I think that's, that's I, I find that so um, so powerful in its own right, because it is, it is about give, you know, recognizing the agency of those individuals, even when they're atomized, uh, their agency in those spaces uh, and their ability to do uh, forms, important forms of work that do uh, represent and return to the communities that they that they're from, and I think that that is a very important um, way of of understanding uh, th those individuals. Yes, not to uh, not to um, unwittingly burden them with responsibilities and the presumption of of um, uh, uh, yeah of of knowledge. Um, yeah, at the same time to recognize that they are bearers of pr precious knowledge that um, they do offer, as you say, gifts uh, to the institution. And uh, I, 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 I'm really struck by that, <laughs> by that response, uh, precisely because it was not simply uh, how, how difficult it is. And, and maybe in, in, in different ways, we, we understand how difficult that is. But I, I, it's the response that that is about agency, and <laughs> that, that I'm, I'm just really struck by. Yeah, it. I, in my PhD methodology chapter, <clears throat> I wrote quite extensively about the levels of accountability, because I had talked to fourteen knowledge keepers and fourteen what I call visual storytellers slash filmmakers, and they were from all different nations. So I had different levels of accountability 
that I engaged in with each different nation. Plus, I felt accountable to my own nation. So I went and sat with my chief and council, for instance, and the elders group in my community to explain to them what I was doing, you know, around the stories. And, and of course, they all held me to account around because Shequepmik and Scale peoples have had their stories stolen, literally, by white researchers who have copyrighted the stories. And so I, I felt really accountable in that sense, right? And, and um, at the very beginning of my PhD, I put in a caveat that addressed that in terms of the university giving me copyright over what was the content of my PhD. And I said that I would not take or assume copyright over any of the indigenous knowledge that was shared with me by other nations. Because I've got really full conversations with some of the knowledge keepers where they shared immense depth of knowledge from their nation. You know, but they trusted me, right? They know me. They know the kind of work that I do. You know, so, but I had to do that as a caveat to my PhD. And Joanne Archibald was my supervisor. And I remember when I told her that I was doing this, when I was handing it into grad studies, she said, no one's ever done this before, <laughs> right? But it's like, yeah, okay, but let's just do it and see how far we can get with it, right? And, and grad studies accepted it, you know? So it's like all of my years of lived experience being at the various meetings around cultural appropriation with Jeanette Armstrong and Lee Miracle and Mariah Campbell, you know, I was beside them or behind them, right? Kicking down some of those doors. And that's why I feel so strongly about those things. And it's the same kind of thing here at the university, right? That we need to be protective of our knowledge and, and how it gets used, you know, and, and how it's, um, yeah, how it's cared for. You know, so the accountability is about that. It's about ensuring the care of that knowledge, right? That we don't assume, we don't take Western values and plunk it over top of our stuff, right? So it is, it is about that dual accountability.